Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, making it at th this early. It's, not, it's never an easy spot, uh, either for speakers, but also for attendees, actually, uh, to, to come so early. Now I'm totally blind. So uh, I'm over here. Um, yeah, so thanks for, for making it. Just to get an idea of the audience a little bit, uh, how many of you currently practice chaos engineering in their companies? And hold on, I'm talking real chaos engineering, I'm not talking just chaos, okay? Because <laughs> that's a totally different thing. Uh, and chaos engineering, so how many of you really practice chaos engineering? That's just quite a few, it's like two. So it's a very popular discipline, as you can see. Um, so I'm going to tell the story a little bit of, uh, of chaos engineering and, and why I, uh, I'm talking about it. I've been working with distributed systems for about 12, 13 years, 11 of which were on, uh, on the AWS cloud. So since the very beginning, I've worked uh, uh, with the cloud technologies. And I've joined AWS itself three years ago about and help customers build and architect their large-scale systems and applications and, and things like this. So this kind of whole story here is a collection of um, most of the failures that I've had uh, in the last 12, 13 years, and, uh, and so that you don't have to do them. Okay, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll see where we're going. But if I'm talking about chaos engineering, usually... Uh, this is what people have in mind. How many of you actually have been in this situation where you are working in a company, you are a developer, and you do not control the deployment pipeline, and then you're like, yeah, screw it. SysOps will uh, we'll do it. So how many of you actually push, uh, deploy, uh, build things and deploy it at the same time? How many of you? Right, cool. How many of you just deploy? This is one brave dude. And uh, how many of you just code? Right. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a thing. Like, so there's always this uh, imbalance between you know, who writes the code and who publishes it. In the back, there's actually plenty of seats in front if you want, so don't, don't stand up uh, if, if you want to, to come there, seats in front. And the problem is, uh, in the last 10 years, and I think this is quite a miracle for, for most of us, we don't yet realize, but we've witnessed a massive, massive evolution, right? From having physical machines to actually all the way to serverless. I'm not going through all the benefits, but at the end of the day, what, what we are going to, uh, towards to is uh, um, solutions where our code, on, when we write code, we only focus on business logic, right? And that, that means that we are more and more moving towards very, very large-scale microservices infrastructure. In fact, now with functions, we are even moving towards what we call nano, nano services. So functions are kind of very, very dedicated uh, microservices with a lot of different databases. Each of those microservices or nano services might have its own kind of database and things like that. So it becomes quite complicated. And because it's very complicated, we're all the time at the mercy of failures, right? And this is Werner Vogel, uh, who is a CTO of Amazon, and I'm not putting this quote because the CTO of Amazon is generally a quote that totally changed the way you need to think about architecture, is that everything will fail, right? And if you think about 10 years ago, we were architecting against failure. Uh, now we are architecting embracing failures. And this is a totally different way of thinking about architectures the, because it makes you do things totally differently. And the problem, actually, and he even had a talk, actually, a few years ago talking about failure, and during his talk, the whole building ran out of electricity. Right? So it really, uh, failure really happens all the time. So if you think about what it is currently uh, to uh, build large-scale systems, it actually looks like this. And most of the time, it feels like this, right? Uh, you're like really at the edge. You're doing gymnastic at the edge of the cliff, and a very, very small change or a very small uh, imbalance in your system can take you totally off the ground. And this is the whole story of chaos engineering. And why we are there is because in those large-scale systems, normal testing doesn't work anymore, right? You do not anymore rely on unit testing because 
unit testing checks your functions or your core uh, code really isolated from everything else. Functional testing, which is a bit wider test, is not enough, right? Nowadays, you have systems dependencies that can span through 60, 70, 80 different services, right? If you, if you think about the number of, for example, uh, uh, Amazon has about 1,000 plus services, right, in their web pages. There are some of, but hundreds of them that are critical to the environment, right? Uh, Amazon.com, the retail site. Uh, Netflix is the same. They have about 20 plus critical services and about 150 different microservices that serve the page when you go on Netflix. And these are so big dependency. How do you test that? How do you test the effect of uh, a change of latency at, at, the, at the entrance of your architecture on the database, which is maybe 20 or 30 uh, uh, layers lower? There are places, again, in front, if you want, uh, folks on the back, there are some people uh, standing up. And at Amazon.com, in the mid-2000, uh, we recognized the big problem, right? Amazon.com was growing massively. Uh, we were going global, and therefore, we had a lot of uh, problem or new problems managing this kind of very large-scale infrastructure. And we brought one guy called Jesse Robbins. And Jesse Robbins is quite a special dude. He has a background in firefighting, right? So he's a firefighter. And firefighters spend 80% of their time practicing fighting against fire in a controlled environment. It's a practice, it's training. 80% of it is training so that the 20% when they go on mission, fight fire, they're trained. Yeah? They do not sweat, they do not panic, they know what to do. And this guy took that principle and applied it to Amazon and called something game days, where actually they would start practicing what happens if we start breaking things, right? What happens if, for example, we switch a whole data center? And in fact, they even done that a few times. The first few times didn't go very well, <laughs> but we learned a lot. Huh? And a lot of these lessons learned from game days actually gave birth to AWS at the end of the day. Uh, because we started to decouple the application, the logic from the infrastructure, make it very resilient, and therefore we could then use it for uh, our customers. And I love the title of Jesse Robbins as uh, Master of Disaster. I think if you uh, can put this on your CV, uh, you're, you're good, good to go. And in 2013, there's been a, quite a, a dramatic event. Actually, it's 2012, end of 2012, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, Netflix went, uh, went out. It had a big outage for a few hours. The problem is Netflix had nothing to do with it. The problem was AWS. <laughs> uh, the ELB data plane uh, experienced an outage uh, and took Netflix down with it for a couple of hours. Uh, don't worry, you can use ELBs. We fixed the issues. <laughs> it's a lesson learned. But from that lesson, Netflix thought, OK, I don't want to rely anymore on uh, on the infrastructure, I want to be able to control my faith, right? And they went on to create the first active, active multi-region architecture across, uh, across AWS and across the globe. In fact, they started to have multi-region in the US and expanded uh, in 2016 to have a third active region in Europe, right? And when I'm saying active, active it means that they can send any of their users to any of those regions, right? They actually do a full switch one region to another in about 10 minutes. Right? So if one region is experiencing issues, they shift the entire traffic to another region actively without you realizing it. In that fiction, actually, they even practice this. Right? When, they, when they started to go multi-region, they started to create the famous, now famous, Chaos Monkeys. And the first one in the middle was the first uh, Chaos Monkey ever created. Now it's been rebranding the Simian Army, but the first one was randomly in their environment, destroying things, killing instances. Uh, they had very big auto scaling groups, thousands of instances, and the monkey was just randomly killing them. Uh, and now their monkeys have grown into the big gorilla behind. Is actually practicing about once a month, killing another of the entire region and practicing a switch of traffic while you're watching Netflix in production systems. And this is all what we call chaos engineering. And nowadays, there's many, many companies practicing chaos engineering from Fidelity to uh, you know, LinkedIn, Yahoo, Kubernetes, Twilo, Google, uh, all those big companies. 
that run in very large-scale infrastructure rely a lot on chaos engineering to understand how their big systems and large-scale systems behave and interact with each other and fix issues before they happen in production. Because that's the whole point of going into chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is really breaking things or experimenting with uh, breaking things so that you gain confidence. Uh, you build confidence for your team into the same way as a firefighter builds confidence into fighting fire. You build confidence for your team to fight outages. Uh, so you break things on purpose when everything is at the office so that they don't have to be at 1 a.m. being paged and say, oh, the system went down. Uh, so when everyone is at the office, it's much easier to uh, practice breaking things and have engineers solve the problems when it happens. So that's the whole point of chaos engineering. And in fact, most of the chaos engineering relies on fault, fault injection. Fault injection from very small things. So you inject latency, for example, in your application, uh, in the UI or in the load balancer. You can do resource attack. All of a sudden, you force a machine to go 100% CPU and see what happened in your environment. Uh, how does your environment uh, answer? You can make network attacks, or you can break regions. But there's also people attack. For example, I've worked a lot in companies where there was this one guy, this Paul, <laughs> that fixes everything. Right? Uh, he knows everything, fixes everything. How many of you have a Paul in their company that is great, and that if he dies today, we're fucked tomorrow? How many of you? I mean, I had polls all over the place, right? And that's the point, right? We need to test that. And it's a failure injection. It's a people failure injection. And it's something that you need to test as well. So if you think about chaos engineering, and especially if you try to sell that to your management, this is pretty much how your management is going to look like. Because they're going to say, hold on a minute. Uh, you want me to pay you to break our things, right? And that's pretty scary. But if you think about the whole thing, it's really... Uh, chaos doesn't cause problem, right? And this is Nora Jones, who is uh, uh, a chaos, uh, chaos engineer. So Netflix says it beautifully, say, it doesn't create problem, it just reveals them. And that's a good way to sell it to your management, especially it reveals the problem when everyone is in the office allowed, able to fix it. But don't go now, next Monday morning, say to your management, hey, I learned we need to break things in production, dude. Uh, let's kill a database. You don't do this Monday morning, right? Uh, I don't have insurance liability for that. You have to do a lot of work, right? And you have to actually architect your solution to be very resilient. And you have a lot of work to do on the infrastructure, on the network and data level, on the application level, and on people level, right? Until you can put a stamp on all this layer that, oh, those are resilient uh, to disruption, you cannot just go Monday morning and start breaking things, right? That's not the point. We are building confidence. We are not destroying things. All right? The next slides, I'm going to go through all those layers and talk about what created most outage in my life. Uh, so I'm going to give a lot of lesson learned from, from those lessons, right? From those levels. So how do you build resilience in, a, in an architecture from the infrastructure level? First... Let me remind you a couple of things. <laughs> availability is what we are fighting against, right? And in uh, when we deal with availability, we are dealing with what we call the nines of availability, right? Um, and nowadays, a system is said to be quite good in production if you have four nines of availability. So you're going down 52 minutes a year maximum, right? That's kind of the standard. Now, let me tell you a story. One of the first outages I had about uh, six years ago, or seven years ago, massive outage, right? not a big one. Uh, our own, our paging system actually failed to notice us, right? So it took us, Twitter and our customer calling us after 20 minutes right, of being down. It's not fully down, but we are experiencing massive latency issues, problems with database writes, uh, don't ask why we didn't get notified. Again, the system went down to, 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 so that we didn't get notified. It took us another like 46 minutes to identify exactly what were the root cause of the problem. So that means the first two actions before doing anything, we were already out of the four nines. Right? So if you want to aim for four nines, you have to actually understand that 
the only way for you to be highly available, and that's mathematic, I'm not making it up, is really for you to make sure your mean time to recovery is that means the time at which you are notified and putting back the systems back online is almost close to zero, right? Because you do not affect the mean time to, uh, between failure because that's the moment where a system will go down. And failures, as I said, you have, can have random failures, you can have a lot of failures you do not control, right? But the only thing here you control in this equation is time to recovery. So that actually means you need to go automation, right? If you want one way to justify for your management to invest time in automation, give them this equation. That's, that's it. Yeah, so that's a beautiful equation to justify work on automation. But that means also that you need to understand this equation, right? That's the first thing on the infrastructure level is actually if you have a, a, a part X, which is only uh, two nines available, so that means it's actually allowed to be three days, 15 hours down a year. The first thing you need to do is put it in parallel. Right? Without doing anything on the application, okay, you need to be stateless, but without doing pretty much anything on the application, you allow it to all already become four nines available. Right? That's mathematic. Again, I'm not making it up. If you make it three times in parallel, you are already at 31 seconds a year. That's actually top of the uh, of the art in terms of availability. So that's actually pretty straightforward to increase availability of the system. Unfortunately, a lot of people still don't uh, don't know that. No? And that's actually the main reason why on AWS we always always tell people develop your application or build your application on top of two availability zones. Right. In AWS, we have kind of different concept of regions than most of other cloud providers. Our regions actually are clusters of data centers, and they are clusters of availability zones, right? In some regions, we have up to six, seven availability zones. Standard is three, and each availability zone has actually a cluster of data center from one to many uh, data centers. And each of those availability zones have a different flood plane, a different electric uh, grid, a di different earthquake plane, so that if one AZ goes down, it doesn't affect the others. So that's a very good way, simple way to increase your availability in the cloud. Now, of course, the second thing is to uh, make sure your application is is auto-scaling, right? So that's auto-scaling is one of the first features that appeared in AWS on EC2 like uh, seven years ago to m allow application to, uh, to automatically launch and scale down so you don't have to, you know, launch 1,000 instances because one day in the year you might need 1,000 instances. Okay, so auto-scaling is a very good way to... Uh, to make sure your performance as good. Of course, infrastructure as code, I don't have to sell that to you. I think uh, most of people know that uh, infrastructure as code is the most important thing, especially for automation. And as I said in the equation, the fact that you want to be available, the only thing you need to do is mean time uh, to recovery needs to be as close to, uh, uh, to zero as possible. So the only way to do that is remove the human from the equation and make sure your system is deployed using, uh, using infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code simply means that your infrastructure is actually in a template, right? And deployed with a computer, and the template is version control. So you can have teams suggest changes in the infrastructure, make it reviewed, deploy it, and most beautiful thing with infrastructure as code is you can replay it, for example, every day. Because there's always those guys in the environment that go and change things manually. And, you know, then you have configuration drift. If you replay infrastructure as code templates every evening, for example, you're sure to remove this kind of configuration drift. So in my opinion, it's a beautiful thing to do this. Immutable infrastructure is also, in my opinion, one of the most important things uh, to invest in, in large-scale system. The sole purpose of uh, immutable infrastructure is to never update a system in place, right? That's the point. Uh, the problem, uh, if you update a system in place, so if you mean if you update the code, that means, and you update the dependency on the system while it's running, that means that it's much harder to, uh, to roll back. Right? If you update a system through parallel deployment, so you create a canary deployment, you deploy a new environment, 
move 1% of the traffic to this new environment, test the system, warm it up, figure out if everything goes well. And if it goes well, then you update. Yeah, uh, then you move more traffic, and I'll explain a bit more later. On the network and data layer, you have a couple of things that are very important. One of the most important things to do, especially if you uh, use database and transactional database, is read-write sharding. Right? This is a no-brainer uh, that uh, should be done. Unfortunately, I still see a lot of, uh, of our customers and people uh, putting directly database comments or in the business logic. That means it becomes very difficult uh, to separate the reads and the writes. I have an abstraction layer so that actually uh, your uh, middleware can do this abstraction for you. And nonetheless, being, having a read-write uh, sharding allows you to send all the reads to the master and then all the, uh, all the write to the master and all the reads to the different read replicas. On AWS, if you use RDS, you're allowed to have five read replicas. If you are using Aura, you have 15. That means you can have very, very... Uh, uh, big throughput on the reads. And that's a very good way to start scaling your databases. Another one which uh, we see often uh, is that the fact that people put uh, databases in the same instance and some databases that don't, uh, or tables that don't have any uh, transactions. So if you don't have joins between uh, databases, there's no reason why to make them uh, uh, in the same host, separate them because then you can scale them uh, independently from one another. And that's actually a very, very simple trick as well to do. Again, on the abstraction layer, it should be done because it's so difficult to refactor code and go through all, uh, all the, the, the code if you have not done this abstraction and you call directly your database in the, in the business logic. The last, the last one to do on scaling database is is what we call uh, the, the sharding pair ID. So that means that you define a, a range of IDs. For example, if you, uh, if you have a, a, a shard that is, or you can use the name of people or most common ways to have the geolocation as a shard ID. And so that means if you're global, you would have a location in, in Europe, in US, in Asia, or you can have several in Europe uh, as well if you want, if you use Frankfurt, Dublin, UK, Paris, you can have several uh, databases. So customers, especially like uh, the Facebook, Instagram, Amazon.com, use this technique of sharding databases per geolocation a lot. Makes it a lot easier. Of course, you might have once in a while 1% uh, or 2% of the people that move from one region to another. Uh, but uh, for those 1%, or 2%, which will have maybe an increased latency because you need to do multi-region write access, it's, it's still a good compromise for the 99% of the rest of the population. Um, another technique which is very important is asynchronous patterns. There's two uh, especially that are, I think are great in, in, in decoupling systems, is the listener pattern and pop sub pattern. Uh, both use queues. It just depends if they are listening to it or polling, uh, polling for updates. And one of the most beautiful ways to use that pattern uh, to scale your system and to make it highly available is to isolate the API front end to the back end. Right? Uh, so that means that you are embracing now asynchronous patterns. That means that when you make a, a, a call to the API, you return immediately with an ID. Uh, instead of processing the request and returning once the request is processed, you return an ID, and then that ID is the ID of a job that is passing to a queue. Then you have workers instances that will take that, uh, that message from the queue and then process it and put the result in cache. Now, the beautiful thing is once the result is processed, then you can send a notification to the client, and the client can come and fetch the result directly from the cache. Now, the, the cool thing as well is you can see the API instances and the worker instances are in two auto-scaling groups, right? And in fact, you can have as many auto-scaling groups as you have of API. I've worked with companies where some part of the API, the routes were really CPU bound, so you have to have instances that are, or systems that are CPU uh, intensive. Some of them are more memory bound. You don't know really the patterns. Having this kind of uh, 
uh, flexibility to optimize the APIs uh, per what they are going to do is good. And same for the workers. Huh? And actually, you can also apply what we call priority queues. So you don't need only one queue. You can have three, four, five, as many queues as you want, especially if you start to have high priority uh, APIs, right? So you can have low priority queues and very high priority queues so that the worker instance first fetch messages with high priority so that uh, they are uh, dealt first. And of course, the pattern, the simple pattern here to scale this one is to use the size of the queue, right? So the size of the messages in the queue can affect how many instances you deploy uh, to process those messages. So as the, crew grow, the queue grows, you can increase the number of worker instances to process, to process the messages. Now, one of the most important uh, algorithm that you need uh, to embrace and to make sure that it's actually uh, implemented in your system is called the exponential backoff. This is a killer uh, algorithm, especially it's good because it's uh, fighting against a killer <laughs> problem in uh, distributed uh, systems. Uh, the exponential backoff is an algorithm that will wait proportionally longer to the times uh, how many times it fails, right? So it, it will double the time between retries. So the more retry you do, the more time you wait between retry. And in fact, exponentially proportional. That's why it's called exponential backoff. And this algorithm was invented once uh, when they were working on TCP IP protocol to avoid having congestion, especially when systems started to experience errors all the other distributed systems were retrying at the same time and then ends up having network flooded with, or 80% of the network uh, being flooded with retries, which can take your system down. In fact, I've experienced two outages, uh, one outage especially uh, because one of our dependency, the library we were using to query Redis, right? it was a, a library that was accessing Redis and we had the clusters. Uh, we have lots of microservices, about 70 microservices accessing Redis. Some of them started to experience errors and retried automatically. And they were, they were in an endless retry loop. Uh, that's because we didn't take care uh, of verifying the library if it was implementing exponential backoff. And this is a big mistake because it took all the system down, everything down. Because the network was congested, all the applications started to, uh, to go down, domino effect. And this is something important. So if you use uh, libraries that you do not implement yourself, verify, verify that they actually do implement exponential backoff. Uh, it's a standard, but never, never uh, assume it because, as I said, it uh, still takes uh, us by surprise. Another one which, in my opinion, is probably the most important pattern uh, for increasing reliability uh, and especially uh, understanding, uh, increasing the way your application behaves is Circuit Breaker. Circuit Breaker is quite simple. Instead, if you have two systems A and B, instead of calling the system B by its URL directly, uh, you actually call it through an object or you uh, englobe the call in an object. And that object is as at least two, two things. It has a threshold control of errors. So uh, it will monitor, this object will monitor how the error rate or the threshold of the dependencies you're trying to call. And if the dependency is experiencing some issues, so increased latency, uh, uh, increase of, uh, of uh, CPU memory, you never, you can have a lot of different metrics, it will secret break. It will break automatically instead of calling, it, calling the dependency and ending into a timeout because timeouts are killers in applications. Right? So you want to avoid this. You want to avoid having your application uh, being in timeout so you circuit break it before the problems happen. And that means that when your developer uh, makes this uh, uh, object, it can think about uh, a graceful degradation. It can think about what happened if my dependency fails, what should I return? And this is a very, very good way uh, sorry, to, uh, to make a developer think about uh, um, graceful degradation. And I'll, think, I'll show you a bit later what, what uh, graceful degradation means on the UI for Netflix. 
Now, of course, you're going to have a lot of distributed systems, so you need to have some sort of uh, routing, dynamic routing, routing between systems and, uh, and services, and there's a bunch of, uh, of things you can use. On AWS, there's something called route history, which is a, a DNS, uh, DNS uh, service, and it allows you to do uh, different policy, uh, the latency-based policy uh, routing, which in distributed system is very important since you want to target a service that has least uh, latency, so you answer faster. Uh, you can uh, also use GeoDNS, so that's if you want to isolate users per regions, or you can have this weighted round robin, which is extremely good if you want to do canary deployment, because weighted round robin, you can start with 1% of the traffic to resource, and another 99 and then dynamically, through an API, increase uh, and reduce it so you can dynamically uh, change the traffic pattern in uh, very fast. And all of those can be coupled with DNS failover. DNS failover simply means that if one of the dependency fails, all the traffic will be uh, shifted to the other available resources. And this is what Netflix is doing when they do the whole uh, region breaking uh, exercise. So they cut all the dependencies in one region and then shift all the traffic through Amazon uh, Route 53 to another uh, region. On the application level, you have a bunch of, of work to do. Uh, as I said, since you're going to uh, be in distributed systems, you're going to uh, have auto-scaling and you're going to have multi-level of, uh, uh, of uh, application, it needs to be totally stateless. That's the most important thing. In fact, it's probably the first thing you need to do in your application if you want to uh, start scaling it, is to make sure that you do not store the state of the data inside the application itself, but use uh, a cache or data store outside of it so that other resources, when they start, they can, uh, they can use the state of the previous, uh, the, the previous state of the application. Stateless is quite simple. It means that any request in the system, any subsequent, subsequent request, is totally independent from the other. Right? If two requests need data from each other, it means your application is not stateless. So it means you're going to experience problems. Because as I say, failures can happen anytime. If you kill one instance and it adds state, for example, a uh, 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 session ID or a state of a shopping cart or, uh, or anything, it will be lost. And that's terrible customer experience. Now there's another thing that you need uh, to avoid, and this is one of the second biggest outage of experience, is uh, avoiding having transient state stored into database. And transient state is a state that is going to be mutated maybe after one second, after two seconds, even 10 seconds, but especially after a few milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. And the most common patterns we see or I see in outages due to transit state is people storing counters in databases. Yeah, counters are uh, no place to be in a database because it's a state that will be mutated. Uh, so don't waste database resources for that. If you're going to have counters, use dedicated data store like Redis, Elastic Cache, especially if you have uh, list or sets or reverse sets or a complex object. Redis is especially good at, uh, at managing this. Two of the outage uh, that I've uh, experienced using transit state was created. One, because uh, we had a counter in the database. And a counter in a transactional database actually is an, an update query, for example, uh, and it locks the table. So when you lock the table, that means no other request can happen. And when you are at, we were actually moving from 25 million to 50 million users in that platform, and at rough, roughly 32 million, uh, our database totally went down because the number of update queries uh, on the database took it down. And we had two mistakes, right? The first mistake is actually uh, we didn't monitor the type of requests happening on the database. Big mistake. Always monitor the type of queries you have. And then, of course, uh, do not put counters there. So we moved very fast to using Redis, and then we were able to scale. Uh, and we managed to deploy the, the fix in a few minutes, actually, because the, we had a very good abstraction on the database level and then also uh, all infrastructure as code. So we applied the fix, redeploy uh, a, new, uh, a new version, and, and the system a few minutes after was back up. And that was good. 
Now, the problem as well, one of the big problems when you start moving into a uh, distributed system is a, is a theorem called the CAP theorem. And CAP theorem, again, is mathematic. So even uh, if you do not agree with it, you cannot do anything with it. It simply stipulates that in presence of partition tolerance, so uh, that means that a system where you want to store data, you have, uh, in a distributed system, you have to make a choice whether you uh, choose availability or consistency. Availability simply means that at any point in time, uh, your system will be available to return new data. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same data. It just means it's going to be data. Uh, the consistency means that at any point in time, you will be able to query all the nodes, and they all will return the same value. Right? So that consistency is very good for banking, right? So you don't want to query your bank account, and uh, all of a sudden you have a, a 2,000, and a one second after that you have 3,000, and back to 1,000. Uh, that's kind of would be quite scary. But in most of the systems, it's actually a customer-facing system. What you want to do is focus on availability. That means uh, you need to embrace what we call eventual consistency. And eventual consistency simply means that, as I said, you cannot have the uh, consistency. That means that if you query your data, maybe uh, it will not return the same value. Eventually, it, the whole system will what we call converge. So that means they will all have the same state, but you don't know when. Now, most of the time in distributed systems, in, it's like 100 milliseconds, maybe in very large uh, one can be uh, up to a second or two seconds uh, when you go really global uh, around the globe. Right? But that means there's a few things you need to, uh, to focus on, and that means your processes, especially in the application, should be totally asynchronous. You cannot rely anymore on synchronous processes, because if a dependency uh, is experiencing issues, uh, that means you uh, will be waiting. And waiting means that uh, your UI will be uh, spinning, 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 spinning. Right. So the second thing that is super important is actually not only on the back end, but on the UI design. Uh, and this is something, again, that is always forgotten, uh, maybe because engineering team works separately uh, with UI and then the back end team front. And this is when you have uh, the same person in the room talking about uh, uh, or doing chaos engineering, and I'll explain how you can reconciliate those problems. Especially, it's very important to embrace non-blocking UI because you are in distributed system, because you are eventually uh, consistent, and because you will experience failures. So in that case, in the first UI, you see he's trying to upload a video, and the video upload fails. But so you can't use the UI. It starts uh, or the uploading takes time, and that's what you don't want. Uh, in the second UI, the uploading is actually asynchronous, so that means you can still use the UI uh, while the video is being uploaded. And this is very, very important to, uh, to embrace those, uh, those methodologies. Also, you want to avoid that. <laughs> Uh, we all love the unhandled exceptions. I think uh, it's uh, something we've lived, uh, if, you, if you use computers uh, in the last, uh, last 10, 15 years, you've probably seen that one. We want to avoid that. That's not a good customer experience. And as I said, the circuit breaker is very, very good uh, a few, few slides ago because it allows cost, uh, developers to focus on graceful degradation. And Netflix, if you look at their UI, they have actually my list here, which is uh, my service, which is querying a database, which looks at my information. But they also have a lot of different uh, information. You see they have Netflix original trending now. In fact, 90% of the UI comes from cache. Huh? In, the only service that actually is called uh, directly is my list. And if this fails, what they do is they bump the lower cache up, and then you don't realize it. Actually, most of the time, people don't realize when Netflix is doing chaos engineering or kills regions or uh, break things because they pump, they have graceful degradation in the UI. And I bet you would not even realize if your list is not there at the right moment. Right? So you would just scroll, and then everything is served from cache. And that's a very good way. It doesn't load their uh, backend system. And those all done using circuit breakers. 
Um, on the people level, because that's also important, uh, you have to embrace failures. And this is, I think, a, a, a paradigm shift as well in, in companies that uh, don't let developers deploy, try things, because the more uh, you tell them uh, that they should be scared about failures, the less they will uh, protect the system from going down. And in fact, most of the companies that I've worked with that gave us a lot of freedom and never blamed us when things went down, uh, we were a lot more resilient and very fast. Because people tried stuff, we were able, everyone had, uh, had the power to deploy in production, everyone had the power to fix, so we were uh, very uh, we embrace that power, and it felt good, right? Any developer uh, that feels that, oh, I have the power to fix things, actually will want to do good, right? Uh, we are not the, the mad guy that tries to break things. Another important thing is do fire drills. On the people level, do not let people experience outage for the first time when it happens, uh, uh, because they will sweat. It's extremely scary uh, to, re, to being paged or called by a customer and then say the system is down. Extremely scary. First, you lose your cognitive ability. Uh, it's being reduced by 80% at least. You become really, really stupid. Uh, and that's even the smartest of the engineers I've worked with that, were, that did not practice uh, outages or fixing them became extremely stupid. Uh, we all come there. And that's... It's very serious business. So do practice fire drills. Break the system, not in production first, but uh, in test environment, te in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in staging and the, uh, see how it goes. Replay with real user data. We have all the technology at hand to, to, to do systems like this. See, someone is already practicing breaking things. <laughs> it's good. It's good stuff. So once you've done all this work, uh, you can start doing chaos engineering. And there's uh, six, uh, five stage in the chaos engineering, and it all starts with uh, understanding what's the steady state. And that's the most misunderstood thing. Uh, steady state is not just measuring the CPU or the memory of your system. It's really understanding the relation with your business uh, to the, uh, having a business metric on your application. Netflix use something called the pulse of Netflix, which is how many times you play, uh, pressing on the play button, which is pretty fun, right? They've managed to see that uh, the number of times a customer plays, uh, press on plays, define if the system is stable. Because if it works, you just press once. If it doesn't work, you'll do doom, 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 doom. Uh, and then they use the system to say, oops, we're having an issue. Because the whole business of Netflix is delivering video. Right? At Amazon, 100 milliseconds latency on the UI affects 1% sales. Amazon.com, 100 milliseconds latency on the UI, 1% sales. We've measured that. It's proven, right? So that's, our steady state is the sales number uh, because we, we know it's being affected. As I said, also Google uh, did the experiment. 500 milliseconds latency uh, on the, the loading time is 20% uh, fewer search. When your whole business model is search, you want to make sure you're not there. Right? So understand the business metric, and especially understand what are the acceptable thresholds, because it might change over day, over weeks, over periods of the year. Holidays are very different. Right? So uh, we don't want to have alarms on Amazon.com when it's uh, uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas, we want them just before. Right? Thanksgiving, people usually drop the phone, spend time with family, so you know, the effect on the platform uh, slows down also during holiday periods. Right? But before or during prime days, during Black Fridays, those are the times where we need to understand the state of states. And same with uh, yours. So understand what are the acceptable range, and when it goes above or under, this is when you should have an alarm. And then you go into a phase of... Uh, defining the experiment. And that's the, the whole purpose is asking the what if questions. And this is the most important phase of chaos engineering. You need to have everyone from your company involved in the product, in the, uh, from the UI designer to the back end to the DBA architect, even the CTO. And then ask what if. What if today we practice uh, breaking a database or especially breaking the master? What will happen? So you, 
you will realize very fast that everyone in the room has different stories. And that's the first very amazing thing, is that an architect will think very beautifully, say, well, you know, our system is as a read replica or as a, a, a uh, a, fail, um, a master, uh, master will, f uh, will break, we have a failover that will take up downtown 30 seconds, 60 seconds, everything will be okay. Uh, the UI will say, oh, I didn't think about this, what happens during these 60 seconds when my database is not available? Do you go into read-only mode? How many of you actually think about the read-only mode? Because you have right, read charting, right? So your application still is able to read, but cannot write. What do your application does? How many of you have read-only mode in your application? Yeah, that's what I thought. Not so many. It's just one of the most basic things you should maybe implement, right? Because why not? Your business is not maintaining right database. It's, it's actually serving data. Right? So that's the thing. When you start to ask the question, what if, you can have very funny questions. What if my authentication system doesn't work? Should all the users of the system be banned from using my system? No. If my business is serving videos, maybe if my authentication service doesn't work, it's my fault, therefore I serve movie for free. During the time I fix the system. So my users are happy. They won't go on Twitter, they won't complain, and you'll stay in business. But if you don't ask that question, and if you don't have everyone in the room, you cannot get there. And make it everyone with the problems that say have everyone, CTO, business, from very, very deep engineers, right? And especially, do not ask the what-if questions on system that you know will fail, right? If you haven't done the homework on the all different level, if your system, if you have a doubt that your system will, uh, will break, if you start to put it down, do not ask the question what if, go do the work. You only ask questions what if on systems you think are resilient, that you think you've done enough work, that you think will sustain failure. And then you go into designing the experiment that's mostly who is going to be victim of your experiment, right? So you made the, uh, your experiment is what if I put my master database down uh, and your Customers, or the first time you do that, you probably don't want to have all your customers in the experiment. You probably only want to address the people using the system in your company. That's the most friendly way to start breaking things. So you need to select the number of users and you take it from your company. So that's the scope of your experiment. You repeat this experiment several times. Right? You start with a very little scope, maybe two people, then 10, 100, 1,000, and eventually maybe everyone. So that's you to decide. And the most important thing is, once you run your experiment, you should have a way to stop it immediately. Do not go into breaking things if you can't go back. And this is why canary deployment is, my opinion, the most beautiful thing to have on your uh, architectures, because first you can deploy new versions of your code and do an immediate rollback, because you have dynamic routing, right? and then you can maybe send 1% of your traffic to a new version of the, uh, of the code, or have the new version run the chaos experiment with only 1% of the users. If the chaos experiment doesn't work well, you can roll back. That's it. It's one API call. If your TTL is one second, you're back down immediately. Of course, don't put a TTL on your DNS record of three minutes, because that will create a problem. And then, once you've run your experiment, you have to quantify the results. That means understand the time uh, it took to detect the experiment. As I said, a lot of time running chaos uh, experiment, the first things we uh, expose is that the uh, notification system doesn't work, uh, that people haven't got notified. Oh, oh, they didn't think about monitoring that. They didn't think about monitoring the size of the queue, and all of a sudden my queue in Redis is growing much bigger, and then that's it, doesn't take anything anymore. Uh, what do you do? Do you detect that or not? And then until the whole time, uh, the whole clear and back to having the steady state within the good range. All right. Most important thing is do not blame that person. Do not, do not go into that. It's the most, most, most uh, damaging thing you can do. Uh, that's the problem, in my opinion, with chaos engineering, is that it exposes 
the worst of human nature in some cases. Because developers, and I've been a developer for 15 years, we are like moms with their babies or dad with the babies. It's our thing. If you criticize it, I'll take it personally. And that's super hard to detach yourself from your code. But you have to do it. It's just code. It's business. What you want is make it a, a reliable. right? So accept criticism, and especially accept that one day it might be you that fucks up. right? So don't blame another person because he simply uh, put a counter in the database by mistake. We you will eventually end up making a stupid mistake. Right? We're humans, we are bound to do stupid stuff. And then you're going to understand in the system, and this is the five whys where, why did we have an outage? Oh, my database went down. Why did my database go down? Because I had uh, counters, and the counters uh, killed the database. Uh, why did you have counters? Oh, because uh, we were uh, monitoring the effect of an API in debug and it went into production environment. Why did it go into production environment? Because we didn't have code reviews. All right, so you know what you need to do next. So this is a very good way to understand uh, how, to, uh, uh, how to do it. Nonetheless, it's not the, most, uh, the, the only way. If you ask five people, you might have five different root causes. <laughs> this is the funny thing. So you need to ask more also parallel questions. And this is, again, it's a whole point of discussing with your team. Why did no one help? If there was no code review, why, uh, why was it accepted? Why do we have a culture where we do not uh, have a, a, a pull request? All this kind of stuff. And this can go into very big discussions. Uh, this is why you need to have everyone. And then you go into the fix, and then you have nothing else but just to do this. Otherwise, uh, Liam is going to come and do uh, some damage to you. Uh, yeah, you can't avoid fixing. Once you break it, you're going to have to fix the, the issues. Um, and to close, some of the, uh, uh, the big challenges uh, that I've seen, and mostly, as I say, it's cultural. Every engineer, every developer, eventually, through guidance, manages to, uh, to fix uh, different layers. Culturally, that's where it's very hard. Right? And the, as I said, uh, it's, you get into very heated discussions. Uh, sometimes I felt that I was in the middle of a boxing game, and you don't want to, do, to, to do there, go there. So... You have a lot of work, especially on the cultural part, to do this. And I, I noticed the, <laughs> and this is just the, I'm French, by the way, so I, I know, and I worked for 17 years in Finland, and I noticed the southern my customers are, the more heated the discussions are. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's the Latin, uh, uh, the Latin blood, but uh, up north, people are quite cool. Um, I've done work with uh, uh, Portuguese and, and Spanish and French, and uh, I thought that uh, things were going to, uh, to explode. So this needs to be managed, uh, but it's, it's still after discussion. Everyone understood that we just uh, had to fix uh, the issues. And as I say, it takes time. Uh, just to give you an idea, Amazon.com moved from a very big monolith uh, in the early 2000s to a bricked uh, 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 microservice architectures with thousands of services, changed the culture from a very, uh, horizontal, uh, very vertical to very horizontal with two pizza teams. It took six, seven years. All right, so it takes time uh, to change culture, so be patient. And this is probably the only advice I can give you. Think big, but act small. Right? And it's the same with chaos engineering. Do not start breaking big stuff. Act very small, because sometimes just 100% 100 milliseconds latency will take all, all what it takes to figure out all the problems you have in your, in your system. On that note, if you want more resources, this is what you can have. Uh, I'll publish all the slides, and uh, I also write a lot on Medium about uh, resiliency and availability. And uh, don't hesitate to send a, a message on Twitter or if you want to uh, discuss more about the topic. Thank you very much. Have a great day.